know. I want to know. Let me just do it and get it done. So. <laughs> and uh, you were listening to the Big Questions podcast where we talk about love, death, sex, religion, uh, wrestling, and all the big questions worth asking. Uh, I'm your host, Robert K. Elder, and today we're talking with uh, wrestler Colt Cabana, uh, DIY icon and host of the podcast, The Art of Wrestling. Uh, he's also our guest editor in Deerfield. Uh, the Big Questions is sponsored by Sure, purveyors of professional microphones and headphones. You can check them out at Sure.com. That's S-H-U-R-E.com. And the Big Questions podcast is part of the Sun-Times Media Local Podcast Network. Colt, welcome. Yeah, and I do a podcast too, and I don't even get sponsored by Sure, but I, I do use <laughs> Sure microphones. So that's like a real thing. Good job, Sure. Well, and I, I want to talk about your your podcast. You know, again, it's the art of wrestling. You're up to what 160 episodes now. 196. 196. 196. And you, you know, you've interviewed a lot of people in the business, and I'm I'm wondering what lessons you've taken away. You know, and 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 how has it improved your game in and out of the ring? Um, well, I wouldn't say necessarily interviewed. I, I usually say I converse with. Sure. Uh, you know, I, Bruno San Martino was on my podcast, wrestling legend. That was more of an interview, uh, but that was cool to have him on. But yeah, I, I've, I've basically sat down with 196 professional wrestling people. And uh, I mean, I guess the most important thing that I've learned is that we're just all people and we all have fears. And I think the podcast is based a lot about like, what have we gone through to achieve this goal? And some people we see, you know, I, I guess in the regular world, you look at Barack Obama or even, you know, maybe even a Mayor Daly or whatever it might be, and you're just like, these aren't real people. They're they're just these fictional superheroes that we all look up to, but the reality is is they are real people and they had a long, hard struggle. And I think it's important to, to dissect uh, and break down and make sure that we all understand that, that everyone's kind of had their troubles uh, to get where they're trying to get, for the most part, the good mm -hmm. ones, the good ones that we like. I'm also, you know, again, you're our guest editor in Deerfield. You were born and raised, um, used your bar mitzvah money mm -hmm. to uh, fund your uh, wrestling career. Um, so I'm just wondering, you know, what are the, you know, give me a tour of Deerfield, you know, sort of an audio tour of Deerfield, the places that formed you. Um, well, I, I, you know, it's, it's, all, it's the only thing I knew growing up. It, it seems like a typical suburban place. Um, uh, I'd say a, lo a lot of Jewish kids, but I think it's probably about half. Mm. But in this world of like where Judaism isn't like, it's, I don't even know the percentage. Do you know that like, it's like 2% of the world is Jewish. I don't know, 5%, 1%, maybe less than that. But I guess so when it's half, that's, that's a high number. And I don't, I hate to like, uh, throw Judaism on the Deerfield, like, like that's their thing, but I don't know. I always kind of took it that. It's as a very that. strong community. Yeah. The, yes. The, the the Hebrew members. There's a lot of uh, synagogues over there in, in that area on the North Shore. Uh, but I don't know. You know. I guess if I'm sitting here on audio, looking back, the the fall had different colors, uh, leaves, and and you know, trick or treating. We would always go out, and it's a typical great fun community. There was always a lot of local. Uh, pizza places and local like uh, uh, fam like locally run restaurants. I think food is always a big thing for everybody, you yeah. know. And you have, we have a lot of memories of growing up. Like Judy's Pizza in the Commons was always there. We ride our bike to the Commons uh, up, you know, Deerfield Commons uptown, and um, Dear Frank's and El Forno's. And there's just these all these places that we would all go as kids. Tony Subs and you know I'm in Chicago and I'm around the world all a lot. But when I go back, you you go back to these places and that's you when i go back to deerfield like that's uh it puts a smile on your face because it's it's your childhood and you're reminiscing and you remember the good times and uh yeah yeah god i mean i play you know paintball playing football <laughs> playing sports uh, i was just a normal a normal kid from that area right and you you also played football you went to, to college on a football scholarship i did not go on a, on a on football the... scholarship but i did go uh to western michigan university to pu to play football and you did yeah. play football so yeah. but did so did you play in deerfield then yeah i, I played for deerfield the freshman team uh, sophomore team, and then I played two years in varsity. And I, I guess that's another thing. Like, I was a big part of the sports program, I guess. Played two years of baseball and two years of basketball also. And, um, yeah, I don't know, like, the Adams Field. You know, Deerfield, like, when you go to – when I guess when you go to any school, but you, you think about the legacy and you hope about the great legacy of the sports that came before you. So guys like Lindsey Knapp were like my hero. And, and you look now, and he was just probably some dude, but he was the guy who played on – he played on the uh, Green Bay Packers. 
And uh, I went to school with a guy, Trent Jurwitz. I think his brother was, I want to say Brian Jurwitz. He played on uh, the Wisconsin. Like, they were the, the Big Ten champions. Mm. And then back in, like, the 70s and maybe the late 60s, like, there was Coach Adams, and he led the Deerfield Warriors to uh, to a state championship. And so, like, you know, as a high schooler, we were like, these guys were legends. You know, I, I wonder now as a 33-year-old, like, how legendary they really were or in the aspect of it. But when you're stuck in one little community – uh, yeah, you know the folklore and the stories continue. Well, I, I, and I think it's important still to have heroes. I think I think that's really important. And so, which I just sp- make sure you don't meet them. <laughs> which has happened to me <laughs> a lot. Okay, so so tell me one of those stories. You've derailed my question. Tell me a story. Oh, oh, oh! Uh, you know, I, I was signed with the WWE. I mean, right. a lot of these guys were my heroes. It's, that was what I wanted to do as a kid was be in the WWF, and then later the WWE. And I worked very hard, and I got there. And then in that system is all these guys who, when I was a child. Uh, they were the, they are now like the agents they're the people in charge the producers they're the ones telling you what to do and how to do it and I'm not much of a corporate man or and, and I don't really like people really telling me what to do necessarily especially when they hold their authority over me and that's happened a lot in my, in my life is people holding authority over me for the for the I would say the wrong reasons, but with negativity. Mm. And and uh, as someone who was a camp counselor in Deerfield and someone who, you know, held a, a position of authority, sometimes, you know, as a teacher at Shepherd Junior High School for two years, uh, you know, I, I just see so much out of being a positive, um, I guess, you know, role model or whatever it may be, just shedding positive light to somebody instead of using negativity. So uh, in the WWE, when I was there, there was just a lot of people who were, were my heroes and I watched on television and just mean people, you know, and they were mean and they weren't the, the legends that I saw them on television. And it's sad, but then you just realize like, oh, you know, these these poor guys, I feel bad for them. I know in my heart of heart, I'm a good guy and I have good intentions. And uh, these poor guys are, uh, they're, 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 they're sad people. Well, and, uh, you know, I, I had this conversation once uh, with uh, the director, Kevin Smith, and he talked about, you know, loving the uh, uh, Fletch movies and then meeting Chevy Chase. Oh, God. And then it went downhill. You hear there. a lot of stories about <laughs> meeting Chevy Chase. So so, so d- who uh, who did you have that exchange with? Who broke your heart in that yeah, way? Yeah, I, I don't. Let's see. That's the – I'm on here. You know, now on Twitter, so for those of you who don't know, so let's talk about a recent thing. Um, Kevin Nash and Roddy Piper. Mm-hmm. Roddy Roddy Piper and Kevin Nash have recently just been like at war on Twitter against each other. And uh, just the negativity kind of, it, it bothers me that they're making this stuff so personable and putting it out there for everybody to see. And, uh, and I just, uh, that specifically pointing out people with negativity is, uh, is, it's not for me. It's not my thing. So I could sit here and I could tell you about the people who were mean to me and who were, were uh, influences in making me a better person because I knew what I didn't want to be or who I didn't want to be. But then I don't want to give them the publicity and I don't want to let them, I don't want their star to shine. So, you know, I, I withhold names <laughs> and I'm uh, happy to. Yeah, the, and and I like to focus on on the great people the that were there the the Norman Smileys of the world and the Dr. Tom Pritchards and the Billy Kidmans and uh, you know the, the the great mentors who were great to a young. Uh, I guess not aspiring wrestler, but aspiring WWE superstar. Yeah. Well, and and the, the thing about uh, Roddy Piper and and, and Nash, uh, you know, I had been a wrestling fan since I was small, and part of me just didn't buy it. I was like, is this basically them? Oh, you know, maybe, yeah. yeah, them basically doing the the chatter beforehand. You know, like I, it just made me doubt like the sincerity of that fight. Using back in the day, they would use the television to get people interested in them, and now they're using social media. It's their outlet. Yeah, maybe. I don't. You know, that's. I guess it got pretty personable, but so maybe it's not them, you know. But just when people start, just uh, I don't know, taking digs at people, and especially if you take a dig at someone who I know is a good person, like it's just I don't. What kind of person are you? Yeah. So it's not in my heart to do it. Well, let's go back to Deerfield. Yeah. So, so uh, when you go back to Deerfield, where are the places you visit? Oh, well, like I said, I mean, I hit up, I hit up Deer Franks, I hit up El Forno's, Tony Subs. Uh, um yeah have have you been back to visit your high school i i wouldn't no no. Yeah. Well, but then the reason I ask is you talk about all those idols, those people who you worshipped. I'm wondering, and which high school is it? I went to Deerfield De- High School. De- Deerfield yeah. High School. Um, so, uh, you know, is your name on that wall someplace? Have they honored you in some way? Oh, I doubt it. To be honest, you're the first person ever from Deerfield to kind of reach out in any aspect. And I, I don't, it's, uh, I don't really, it's, 
I don't, you know, it, it's nothing I've uh, held a grudge on or anything, but just uh, I'm not sure the world of Deerfield even knows what I'm doing or, or what I'm about. So uh, I, I don't think I'm on any kind of high school wall <laughs> or anything. I'm just uh, I'm just trying to get by. Well, um, and uh, you started uh, wrestling uh, at Steel Domain, which, uh, which is a Chicago wrestling school. For for the the rest of the world, like how is Chicago wrestling different than any other style of wrestling? Mm. Well, I mean, nowadays, uh, you know, with I guess with the internet and the idea that everything's kind of becoming uh, global globalized, like a lot of wrestling, uh, it's all kind of the same now. You know, uh, it can be the same. I mean, it's it's different to where you don't speak the same language. So in Japan, it's different. In Mexico, it's different. In America, it's different. But I, you know, I tour. I've I've done thirty some odd tours of Europe, and I've done uh, a half a dozen tours of Australia. And I go to these places in Canada where where you can where we all speak the same language, and the wrestling is completely the same. We're back before the internet and before people were um, in touch with each other. It was a different style of wrestling because nobody knew what was going on in other places. But now everybody kind of kind of knows. Uh, I came up in 1999. I guess the internet had been around for for a little bit. You know, I, I don't know when it really. I guess the first time I remember uh, getting on was Eli Flicker had AOL and, and, and in 1993, I think, and um, it was a hundred dollars a minute to get on, I think. But you know, so 1993, 1999, that's six years. But uh, my trainers were trained by a guy who was trained down in Memphis, and uh, the wrestling is all kind of there. Back in the day, it was territorialized. You know this. I don't know who listening knows this, mm-hmm. but even though the Memphis style was different from the Florida style, which was different from the Portland style, which was completely different from the Puerto Rico style, and so the Memphis style is more punching and kicking and basics, very basics, as opposed to maybe the lucha libre style, which is a lot of uh, high flying and finesse. So I was trained in a, in, in a very um, basic style of professional wrestling where in Chicago, uh, a lot of the old timers at that point had 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 wrestled in the AWA. And uh, so there was a lot of those guys that that I think the AWA closed down in um, uh, maybe 1988 or 89. And they used to run uh, the Chicago Stadium and, and they would run around the area, around the Midwest. And so 10 years later, some of those guys were still around like they had an they were still holding on to maybe being, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, so those were some of the guys that helped influence my style um, or, and, and the Chicago style. But eventually, as, as the world grew, uh, the, the territo- territorialized styles kind of stopped and everyone just kind of meshed together. Mm-hmm. But you're still a very, you know, physical wrestler. But you also, uh, I know you're a stand-up comedy fan in, in, in particular. You bring a lot of your sort of charisma and your comedy to your persona. So um, that's my sort of next question is, you know, what is the difference between you, Colt Cabana, and, you know, and Scott Colton, the, mm-hmm. the kid that grew up in Deerfield? Uh, there is. I mean, there isn't a lot of difference. I, I think when you, you know, um, when you turn the camera on, like, I understand how to show out for the camera. And I understand that there is a camera and people watching and when the show is there. And, and I and I turn it on. I put it on. But when, I, when I'm home and relaxed, like... I'm I'm pretty shy. I'm I'm I have a lot a lot of weird anxiety fears and like uh you know so I don't um I'm I'm not I'm not that super outgoing. Like I I guess I can be outgoing whatever, but you know as a professional wrestler like I I, I don't drink, I don't smoke, I don't go outside and then like I'm not, I I go outside. Sorry. I don't go out and party and, and I'm not like an animal, you know. So I'm pretty reserved. Uh but I you know when the when the camera's on, when the show's on, like I know I know how to switch it up and 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 put it on and put on a show. Um I, I guess that's the difference between the wrestler and me, but but the the comedy side of me, the that's natural. So I mean, I became a comedy wrestler because I was being a, like a normal, regular professional wrestler, but my natural instinct is just to be a jokester. My natural instinct is fi- just to find the joke in anything, really. Like, that's just my sense of humor. So I would find myself in the wrestling ring, and, and then I would find myself, like, making a quirk or making a joke. Like, I just had to. Like, it was there. It's like when that joke is there, like, you got to do it. Kind of like in a Michael Scott way, you know, from The <laughs> Office. Like, if you watch that, you just see he's like, ah, I got to hit this joke. You know, I hope, like, my humor <laughs> is better than the way he's portrayed, obviously. Um, he's amazing. Um, uh, what's his? Uh, Steve Carell. Steve Carell. Uh, right, obviously Steve Carell's amazing. But the character of Michael Scott is uh, is known as not, like, the funniest. But he, he has to jump on that joke. And so Scott Colton, I, usually I have to jump on that joke. And then 
I mean, obviously that's just, that's also the character that I play it. And when I'm on Twitter and when I'm on YouTube or whatever, and, and I'm, I'm showing it out to the world, it's definitely my sense of humor. Mm -hmm. And, and how did that sense of humor, you mentioned it a little bit ago, uh, you taught at a junior high for two years, is that right? Yeah. So, so, uh, how did that sense of humor, uh, serve you and what did you teach? Uh, so I was a teaching assistant with special needs kids and, uh, it's funny you know, I guess when you talk about sense of humor, I, I work specifically with a kid with Down syndrome and um, and also a kid with autism. But the kid with Down syndrome um, was just like the funniest kid ever. He was he was high functioning. He was always laughing. Like if you I thought a lot about it, like maybe it sucks that he has Down syndrome or whatever. But like the way he looked at the world, like eh, everything was funny. Everything was amazing. He would laugh at anything. You know, he, he would just, I don't know, he, he's walking down the hallway, he, he farts, and he's cracking up about it. Like, to me, it's the best. And you look at a guy in that situation, and he's just making, you know, maybe he doesn't know, but that's all he knows, and he knows just to laugh about it. And um, I, I think in doing that, it, it taught, that taught me a lot, just to make the most and enjoy yourself. And, and there's just two different ways to look at everything. And I choose the lighter side. Yeah. Well, and, and, uh, so was that, uh, was that teaching gig just to stop off? Cause I know you also have a degree in marketing, right? Yeah, it was basically. So I graduated from Western Michigan with a degree, um, in business marketing. And at that point I'd been training for about three, or I'd been wrestling for about three years. And while I was in school, I was traveling all around and I figured, when I graduate, I just go to the WWF like right after WWE, but like that's not how it works. You know, it's like three years in college, wrestling, and then when I graduate, no real job, right right on the road. And uh, unfortunately, that wasn't the way it worked, and so I had to get a real job. And I didn't want to get like a real, real job because I knew eventually I was going to get a real job as a professional wrestler. So like what was the point of – I didn't want to go and jump into some kind of corporation or anything like – so. Uh, you know, I'd worked basically, I think, eight years as a camp counselor in Deerfield and as part of the park district. And um, some of the people who worked at the park district who were camp counselors, they they were doing – this was their other job, was a teaching assistant where, you know, you need a college degree, but also it's – it's the, the hours are easy. The weekends are free. It's great for a wrestler. There's benefits. The pay was awful. Um, but I don't know. I was 22 years old. It's not like I need, really needed money. I just – I guess maybe to support my wrestling habit. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, so I loved working with kids. So it just made a lot of sense. Everything kind of came together. Well, and also, I, I think your your uh, your marketing prowess is evident to me as we sit in your apartment and we can hear the train go by. That's what yeah. you're hearing, ladies and gentlemen. It's romantic, isn't it? <laughs> well, but like you're surrounded by boxes of DVDs and T-shirts, and you know. So uh, again, what did you take from your marketing degree and apply it to your podcast and your career? Because I, I, you know, what I, did I? Well, well yeah. So I, I'm looking for lessons there, but also I think you know, again, you have this amazing following of this amazing uh, podcast, and I think for any other wrestler, anybody else could have chosen to do that, but you were the guy. You know, when mm -hmm. you look for you know wrestling podcast, you are the guy. So what about that background made you qualified to do and achieve this? Nothing. <laughs> <laughs> well, why wasn't it done before then? Why, you know, like uh, you, you've carved out this unique niche for yourself. Um, you know, I, like I said, I say that, uh, I mean, I went to college, but like my education came from, from wrestling, came from going on the road. It came from doing, tr putting in thousands upon thousands of miles and, uh, immersing myself into the world of professional wrestling, especially those first three years. I wasn't worried about money. I, I wasn't worried about fame. I was just worried about just putting myself in that world and, and getting to know, the whole world, learning it, getting better, becoming the best that I can. It wasn't about selling merchandise. It wasn't about podcasting. It wasn't about, uh, you know, finding a brand or anything. It was about learning the job, you know. And that's what I learned is 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 when I started making money with merchandise and T-shirts and DVDs uh, and, and the podcasting, I guess. I mean, I was, I was 10, 12 years into wrestling. And what happened was I had – uh, I had learned a job, I had learned a skill, I had learned a trade, and uh, I started applying it for myself. What happens in the world of professional wrestling is we all depend on other people. And may, and this, is, this isn't just a wrestling lesson, this is probably a life lesson for everybody, is that we all depend on whatever corporation or, or whoever uh, is working at, the, at a higher place to – to get us a gig, to get us this, to get us that, to get us our, our benefits, to, um, you know, whatever it might be. We're just hoping that somebody sees something in us so they can then help us make money and, or whatever it might be, or achieve whatever it might be. And, um, 
And I, I just took it under my own way. And I was like, nah, well, I'm just going to do it for myself. And basically what I did is I took out a middleman, you know, I went through it. And I guess, I don't know if that even that's a, a marketing word or whatever it might be, but I, I literally saw before is, um, there's a bunch of wrestling fans. There's the WWE and then there's me. So the WWE is going to take, I'm going to go on their program. They're going to say, Hey, this guy is good. And then they're going to deliver me to the wrestling fans. That's the middleman. So obviously it didn't work with the WWE because they didn't see anything in me. And then I, you know, I came back to the promotion I worked for for 10 years or eight years and it got taken over by a corporation and the, the new corporate giants or the new corporate bosses in ring of honor, they didn't see anything in me. And so it was like, well, instead of hoping that somebody will see something in me, I'm going to take out that middleman and I'm just going to go directly to the fans because that's who they're, that the companies are pushing yourself to those, the fans, the, the paying audience or whatever it might be. So I, I just took out a middleman and I went direct to the people. Well, and uh, again, your podcast is called the art of wrestling. And, and that's something I'm really interested in that, that seemed to happen about 15 years ago because no it's only been happening four years i uh, know but I'm, I'm, I'm talking about the, the this ability to talk about wrestling uh, as something that's theatrical because i mean i grew up in the 80s with hulk hogan and the hulkamania stuff and all that i, th I think we're you know uh, pretty aligned on that generational thing but you know you would have fights on whether it was real or wasn't real then there seemed to be this shift where wwe was like okay we're gonna give interviews about the stagecraft of it. So when did that shift happen? And when, you know, what, what have we gained from that? Well, it's funny. Uh, I, I always say that professional wrestling is an art and it's subjective. And that's the great thing about it for everyone who says, for all the people who enjoy and like what I do, I read on the internet, the thousands of people who hate my guts and think that I suck. Mm. And it's not about wins and losses in professional wrestling. Uh, I, I'm sorry, I'll take that back. It is about wins and losses, but you, the, st statistically saying, uh, it's not the Expos or uh, the Expos. I don't think they're around anymore. <laughs> the, Why did I say the, the Expos? Expos. <laughs> Real Expos? They had a really bad season yeah. last year. <laughs> I just, I was thinking of the worst team when I was a kid when I watched baseball. <laughs> and uh, oh, okay, God. the Mets. The Mets. Yeah. Okay. Well, well, they're good. <laughs> Oh God! So, but it's not you know it's the Expos always sucked. And so the Cubs, I couldn't say the Cubs, right? Yeah, the Cubs. I mean, when you look at the Cubs' win loss record, it's always losses. You're like, ah, we know that they're not the best team in baseball. And you look at the Yankees, and you're like, they're you know the the, the Red Sox. But for wrestling, it's subjective. Mm -hmm. It's totally subjective, and that's why I, it is an art. But the, the podcast wasn't named the Art of Wrestling because of 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 the art, and I guess the takeaway of uh, whether it's sport or whether it's entertainment. Um, but uh, I used to we used to listen to this group called the Splack Pack um, in high school, and uh, they had a song called "The Art of Gankin," where it's about stealing stuff. Mm -hmm. And so, um, as the art of wrestling uh, got put in as the label, that's where it comes from. It doesn't even come from the beauty of uh, professional wrestling. But yeah, Vince McMahon because of um, uh, because he wanted to um, he didn't want to pay much money for the the regulation of sport was like i can i can i don't have to pay as much taxes or, or whatever it might be if i declare this an entertainment and so that's what he did and so that's that's when it all opened of where, where you could talk about uh you know i guess if it's fixed if it's not scripts and scriptures whatever it yeah. might be yeah because he allowed it he's the he's the godfather of professional wrestling and because he allowed it well then i was allowed to do but uh my podcast itself it's not necessarily i i don't and i still i don't enjoy breaking down uh the scripts i guess necessarily I, it, to me it's more about our, our sacrifices to live this life and less about um the, the tricks of the trade, I guess. Right. And that's something I think you'll notice if, if when you listen to the show is I try not to talk about um, the magic behind professional wrestling. Uh, and I, but I talk more about our sacrifices as people to do to do the professional wrestling. Sure, but I mean it's a lot of your friends, and you still get a lot of behind the curtain stuff. And and all you know, all of you guys are are you know just as geeky about everybody. You know about uh, we were, I think in the podcast you were just talking about Beyond the Mat, which is a famous or infamous you know uh, wrestling documentary. And and so uh, you know I'm interested in these archetypes because you know there's a face hero or heel the the villain, um, and you've been both. Um, I, I'm just interested in, uh, when you play, so for the Juggalos, are you, are you a heel? You're yeah, a heel. Cause yeah. you're, uh, what, what's I'm your I'm a name? policeman, Officer, Officer Cole Cabana. Yeah. The number one in, in the world of the insane clown posse and the, uh, the Juggalos, when you're a policeman, you're the ultimate villain that, you know, the policeman, the one who, 
who regulates the world, who keeps us safe uh, in that world. I'm, I'm a villain, yes. So, so tell me how that's different. Then what's that experience like? Because you're, you're up there to sort of channel people's uh, hate. Like it's a yeah. very different vibe. Yeah, and if you look on, I, like I posted something on my YouTube channel where uh, there was a show in New Mexico. It was in front of about a thousand people, and they threw so much stuff at me that I chopped it up. Like I taped them, I had the match on tape, and I chopped it up, and like. For a minute 30, like I, there's enough, there's a minute, there's in a 10 minute match, there's a minute and 30 of actual stuff being thrown at me throughout the match. You know, <laughs> basically 20% of the match almost. Um, and uh, yeah, that, but that I love it. I love it. You know, and, and like you said, I, I and my friends, we are big giant nerds and love wrestling and love everything about it. And I love that back in the day in Puerto Rico, um, these guys who were villains when people didn't know, um, you know, I guess how much of it was rigged and how much wasn't, they really, 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 really believed that this, whoever this man was, was the worst man in the world. Uh, and they would throw stuff and, and you hear stories and I've heard stories when I wrestled in Puerto Rico, they would tell the tales, um, about people, uh, um, they would burn quarters and throw them at the wrestlers. They, you know, they would throw rocks. Of course, in Puerto Rico, you know, you just find rocks on the ground and you get thrown with rocks and cups of urine and uh, just on and on and on. And yeah, it's gross, but you're like, oh man, that was back. That was it. That was the real stuff, the wrestling, you know? So as a villain, when people do that to me at, at I, the IC, ICP shows, I love it. I get off on it. Uh, not necessarily because... Um, you know, it's cool, but because it's, it reminds me that I'm doing the job that the ones before me did. And I think that's something very important is to keep the legacy uh, of the ones before me. Well, and, and uh, talking about archetypes and that uh, whatnot, uh, you know, there are a lot of uh, just just now. I think we're it's cresting where professional athletes are are coming out as gay. But has had has that happened in the wrestling world? Yeah, Darren Young just came out uh, in the, with the WWE. Um, that that he's a, a homosexual and mm -hmm. uh, and and his his character is as well. I don't think so. Okay, it's funny. You know what's funny <laughs> is um, I had this discussion with somebody the other day, uh, actually in Japan, who I don't speak any English. Um, you one of, any Japanese man, your, I don't, Engl your English is great. I, I don't know. I I, <laughs> I doubt that actually. Uh, one of the Japanese fans told somebody who interpreted to me they 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 thought maybe I was gay mm -hmm. and. Um, and so I've said that Scott Colton, me, definitely a heterosexual, definitely. Uh, the character Cole Cabana might be gay. I don't know. You know, like, obviously, uh, I, because I do a lot of, I slap a lot of people's butts and, like, I, I do a lot of weird stuff. And, like, I'm, I, because I'm, like, influenced by, by, you know, by Dusty Rhodes or by Jimmy Valiant uh, and then also by, like, exotic Adrian Street. And some of these guys were, uh, you know, I think Adrian Street was, it never was really known whether his character was, I guess, because you're not having sexual relations on like camera, no matter what it might look like. <laughs> yeah. You're just wrestling. Yeah. So I, uh, but I don't think Darren Young, the character, um, is I is uh you know a homosexual but, but, but is is scripted gay yeah. right right yeah. right and they've had that before um so I mean Billy and Chuck got married on television uh and I can I mean there's people I I think there's people well, they definitely got married on television and whether later it was all a rouge or whatever it might be at that moment they were portrayed as, as gay guys yeah yeah well and 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 so my interest then is like are are we turning that corner it seems like you know we have you know, it was tennis and, and all those things, you know, uh, football, I think, is getting there. Uh, you know, when you think of just hyper-masculine sports, you know, football and wrestling are at the top. Yeah. So, you know, has, is wrestling turning that corner? Do you think that's going to be uh, less of an issue? I hope so. I, uh, you know, I, Darren Young came out and, like, no one seems to really care, mm -hmm. you know. I, and then not about him, I think they're all super proud for him. But, like, I don't think anybody, there's... Uh, you know, and I've been in locker rooms, I, not in the WWE locker room, but nobody's like, like, I think it's wonderful. It's great. And I think as a society, I know, I guess it's interesting to say like hyper masculine, but I think as a society, um, I, we're all becoming smarter that it's just, it's just idiotic to, that that's even, I don't know, even an issue or whatever. I, I mean, I'm all for, uh, and, and I guess, you know, when Stone Cold Steve Austin is on, in all the, the the trades or whatever it might be is like did you hear his rant on mm -mm, yeah I, oh it was amazing and he's just like 
well, I, you know, if a dude wants to marry a dude, let him do it. I don't care. <laughs> that's Stone Cold beer drinking, flicking off your boss. You know, that's Stone Cold Steve Austin. And he's all for it. So, like, that's I, – I, I do whatever you want. I, I, I say that, and I hopefully the whole, the rest of the world, not only – not just the wrestling locker room say it, yeah. Um, and uh, we're surrounded by DVDs. It's, it's uh, the Road Wrestling Diaries 2, and it's about your life, and it's about um, uh, basically what it's like on the road. Yeah. Um, and uh, some of that, I know the new edition is uh, uh, one of your uh, partners in crime, like, pulled his groin? Yeah. Like, that sounds awful. Yeah, Luke Gallows uh, in the movie, you know, he's he's – his groin is pulled and it's, you don't work, you don't eat. And he, he has a kid and he needs the money and, um, you know, and he's supporting this child and uh, it's like you got to wrestle and you got to do it. So he's got this from uh, kneecap to to, uh, to groin. It's completely black and blue and it's all documented in the movie. But, uh, you know, and, and it's cool that that gets documented because there's been so many times where a lot of us have just been so hurt and so damaged and, and whatever it might be, whether you're able to see it or not able to see it, a lot of us just have uh, – we've gone out and we've performed and it just – you have to do it. You do it. I mean, I know you don't have to, but when you do, you know, you know that you're, you're – I don't know. It's because I guess technically you shouldn't do it and you shouldn't perform hurt. But, um, again, it's a throwback, I think, to the ones before us that that's what they did and that's what we'll do. So – well, and, and I think that's why you have this affinity for stand-up comics. You guys kind of had the same road life. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, you know, you're not only battling injuries, but what does it do to, uh, um, I guess, personal relationships? Are, are you even able to date? Like, how 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 is that to sustain? Yeah, well, it's funny. I went on a, a couple of dates with this girl before, and then I was like, oh, uh, well, first I was like, hey, she's like, what are you doing this weekend? I'm like, oh, I'm going to South America. And then she's like, oh, all right. And then I got back and we went out again, and then I was like, She's like, all right, when do you want to meet up again? I was like, well, I'm going to Japan for three weeks. And so, like, that's been the story of my life, I guess. Um, but, I, you know, I guess in terms of um, intimate relationships or whatever, it might be that's uh, – but I've made personal relationships. Like, yeah, you, like you hope to date and you hope maybe – you you know, maybe you hope to find a wife and have a, have a child and, and have kids and have a family. But um, I have made great relationships around the world. And so – and it's cool that I, I have friends – in Japan, I have friends in England, great friends, you know, Texas, California, whatever it might be. So, um, yeah, maybe in one place, uh, relationships, whatever may they might be, aren't aren't uh, aren't very easy to sustain. But I, I have relationships all over the world, which is pretty cool. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, speaking of relationships, you have a, a relationship with uh, Nami, and they are the um, the charity that you're choosing to champion. So, mm -hmm. can you tell us a little bit about them and why you chose them? Um, yeah, well, um, I guess it, it's about mental instability. And my 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 father um, had some depression and bipolar uh, ha has depression and bipolar, and he treats it every day, and and he goes about it. And Nami, um, they're the company that I guess kind of saved his life, you know. So again, what do, what does Nami stand for? Yeah, it's the uh, National Alliance for Mental Illness. And and how do they save your dad's life? And, you know, um, he, my dad tried to take his own life. Mm. Uh, he was very sick and, um, just, uh, I don't know, just, he, he was always, I don't guess, diagnosed with, with bipolarism and at a, at a young age before, and I really never knew about it. And he had depression issues and he was always, uh, he was, he medicated himself and, and just the, the medication, he stopped taking the medication. He tried to take his own life and, um, and it was, it was more a cry of help than, the the fact of trying to take his own life and um you know he got sent down to a place for for rehab to to figure out you know to figure this stuff out and um and he started working with nami and he's been working with nami i'd say for the past five years now and um they've helped him i guess build you know build a life to to knowing about the the sickness and the disease of mental illness and uh, how to cope with it and how to deal with it and how your family copes and deals with it. And uh, he, he's, he works with them. And now my mother, you know, who obviously, um, not obviously, but I don't think has mental illness, uh, but it's very, obviously very close to her. And um, so it's very cool that she's part of it too. And she's on the board of the Chicago chapter of NAMI uh, along with, with my father. And, um, and it's great. You know, she's, she's, has to know all about my father's sickness and whatever it might be and that, that 
so you know she's working with it too and i think a lot of people brandon marshall who who came out cannot came out as we talk about home homosexuality <laughs> and uh football and wrestling but you know came out as um with, with bipolar and he works with nami too and it's very brave of him to do that for him to do that of course you know brandon with the, with the chicago bears so um yeah so uh, you know it's if i can help awareness any way i can it's very close to my heart with with my father obviously and uh, I guess the least I can do, you know. Well, and and um, were did this manifest itself only sort of later in life, or, or did you grow up with it? Did you did you sort of notice that there was perhaps some manic behavior? Um, yeah, I, I guess. I don't know. You know, I I mean, my father's my father. You know, I, it's I my friend. I, he, hmm. it's always like, but I think this goes with everybody where. You see, like, your father around every day, and then my friends who would come over, like, I feel that they saw, like, a different person, and I'm like, no, you guys don't see when he yells at me or when he does this or when his mood changes this way or whatever it might be. But I think that's with everybody, like, I don't know. That's just, so, but, but I, maybe I saw it, maybe I did, but I, I never knew anything different to compare it to, I guess. Yeah. But, uh, but, but, but in hindsight, did it make you reconsider? Reconsider what? Like after his suicide attempt, did did you sort of reconsider like, oh, well, maybe that's because he was sick. Like, did it make you reconsider parts of your upbringing? Um, I don't know. Uh, if you were if you were noticing sort of manic or extreme behavior and you're like, oh, well, that was part of his condition. That's why he did. But I don't, I don't think I, – I, he had some episodes, but I just thought it was part of being – and I still do almost to read like that's just what fathers do or you know that's just <laughs> who people are like people get upset and people do things he never did anything very you know crazy drastic yeah I was gonna say he should not have gotten in the ring with Jake the Snake Roberts yeah I'm just saying when you buy a ticket that's not part <laughs> right. of the experience yeah he never no never did anything like that no yeah I, I think it was to me it was just it was just normal like the ups and downs of life I guess mm -hmm. and it's it's interesting when you when and as you think I'm 33 and, uh, you know, I think a lot about like, I think my father was on the road a lot and he was, he was doing his work and he was really great at what he did. He's a, is it a, a apparel salesman? And, um, and then, you know, he got to an age where like he, I don't think he was needed, uh, in his job. Industry changed. Yeah. yeah. The industry changed. He fell behind and he was a guy who always refused to have like call waiting and call, you know, like when uh, the remote, we were the last people to have a remote control, you know, like, so when everyone's changing, you know, I'm walking up to the box and changing it. And he, and he, you know, he's now like, I think he just got an iPhone and he's telling me how it's the most wonderful thing ever. When five years ago, he refused to even text anybody, you know? So, uh, so as the industry changes and everything changes. And so then it got to the point where like, he, he wasn't, I don't want to say needed, you know, but like, uh, you know, the, the older generation, it's just like, and I wonder a lot what's going to happen to me, you know? And, and so, and it, it did, it happened to him. And I think it really went to his head of like, oh, well, I, I can't really work anymore or, or make the money that I used to make or, or support, you know, I guess people that I need to support. And then, you know, you, and then on top of that, the illness that he has and it's just like you know what i don't know i don't know i can't speak for him but it's like what use what use is there yeah. for well, me in this world i was gonna say you're literally talking about the plot of death of a salesman basically yeah <laughs> you know? yeah but it's i mean it's it's interesting you know i you know you're 33 but already you're looking to the future you know what's going i'm not looking i'm worried about <laughs> it i'm paranoid and that's why i i don't stop right we talk about me coming from japan and, and right to work and right it's like i'm i feel that like if I'm screwed at 65, like if, if I just know so, so many people that live check to check, like I just, it's, it, it haunts me. It haunts me that, uh, you know, maybe I become of an age where I can't work anymore and then what do I do? And like, so that's a lot of the reason why I guess I'm doing what I'm doing is to try to get some kind of security. It's funny. My mom always wanted me to have secure jobs. Like that's the most important thing to her is for me to have this security. Like that's always been the most important. And like, obviously the life I live, I'm, I'm a, I'm a circus freak, you know, like uh, that's the life I live. There's zero security in professional wrestling. So I think it's interesting that I become this like nomad and gypsy, the world I live. But the reality is, is like, I'm, 
at the end game is about having some kind of security towards the end. Yeah. Well, but I, but I don't think that sort of exists anymore in any industry. I don't think that sort of ex, you know that sort of company mentality. Uh, or even, you know, like, you know, I worked on the line for GM. Mm-hmm. Like, I think the world has just changed. And I think, um, you know, to be mildly complimentary, like, you've proven yourself adaptable. Not only do you have this brand and this podcast and an amazing, you know, Twitter follower, uh, uh, you know, army, but uh, I think it's those sort of skills that even if, you know, it's not those things exactly that are going to make you, uh, you know, marketable in the next evolution, but your willingness to adapt, I think, uh, you know, I hope that's true for all of us. Right. Yeah. Well, thank you. I, 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 yeah, I appreciate that. Um, and, and, you know, Billy Gunn, who's, uh, who was a famous wrestler in the, in the, um, the nineties, was part of the attitude era, the big boom of professional wrestling. Uh, I remember him now he works for the WWE as a trainer and he's got a nice job and he was on TV. But I remember him saying like, man, I, I, this was in, in an interview. He's like, I've been wrestling 20 years and look what it's got me. Nothing like you know, 20 years in the life, it's gotten me absolutely nothing. And I remember being like, A, got you like millions of dollars, life of fame. But he thought like, well, what is his professional wrestling? Like, I can't go and do anything else. And I remember thinking like, no, you can do so much. Like, you've learned about showmanship. And, and there's just so much more than just getting in a ring and wrestling dudes night in and night out. It's just like the life experiences, uh, the ability to uh, maintain yourself as a professional wrestler and how to do that. And, and just like, just everything and i i felt that he was thinking so short just in that one sentence of like look what it's gotten me when i when i was like man it's gotten you so much and not in the jealousy world of like uh i wish i could be there but just like how can you not see that as like a quote unquote business of or what you are that it's it's gotten you so it's gotten you so much uh, 20 years in wrestling. And so I look at that too. Like, I don't just look at, and, and by everything I'm doing, you can tell, like, I'm not just a professional wrestler. Like, you know, I've learned to, I guess, you know, I, I, I hate these buzzwords and keywords, whatever, but like, I've learned about, you know, the, the idea of marketing and, and making relationships and, 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 and seeing how people work and what people like, uh, not in terms of like, just how, when, when dealing with people and the way I want to be dealt with and the way I want to be dealt with, uh, and I've been dealt with people, who have treated me on the bottom and I've dealt with people who've treated me on the top. Um, and I've seen both sides and both spectrums and I know, you know, it's just like, there's just so much I've gotten out of what I've been, what I've done so far and what I will do in the future is that you can go and then you can go take that and you could do anything with it. Mm-hmm. And so uh, I, that's, and when you say about moving on and evolving or whatever it might be is I, you know, I've, I can take my experiences and I can do anything with it. I think that's a great place to end. Uh, Colt, uh, thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, you've been listening to the Big Questions podcast. Our uh, music is by Aaron Sanchez. I'll see you next time.